Well, one of my favourite things to do during the holidays or at the end of a long week, uh, when the kids are in bed perhaps, is to sit down, put my feet up and watch a movie. Uh, we have Netflix on the telly at home now. Uh, don't know if you're all familiar with Netflix, but I think Netflix is great, uh, particularly for those of us who uh, don't have a specific movie in mind that we want to watch uh, because it has all of its movies listed in different categories as comedies, dramas, adventures and action movies. You know, I'm often like that. I'm not sure exactly uh, what movie I want to watch and when the choice is mine, I will invariably go to the action movies category first um, to browse. I like action movies and... Um, I like action movies at the end of a long week because you don't have to think so much. Uh, you can turn your brain off for an hour or so and just enjoy it. Now, I've seen a lot of action movies in my time and I'm going to suggest, without having done any actual data collection, that the vast majority of them uh, have the same character in them. From James Bond to Star Wars, from Batman to Die Hard, from Despicable Me to Milan, this character can be found. Now, you might think I'm talking about the ultra-masculine and muscled hero, the Arnold Schwarzenegger type, uh, but no, that isn't the character I have in mind. Now, perhaps you were thinking about the nefarious villain or a damsel in distress, but I'm not talking about either of them. No. The character I'm thinking of is one who you could almost blink and miss, so minor is their part in the movie. But when you see him, you instantly recognise him. And you know what is going to happen to him. The character I'm thinking of is the unsuspecting guard, who you just know. As soon as you see him, you know that it's not going to go well for him. Now, perhaps it is a security guard on Christmas Eve thinking the baddies are on holidays or the soldier overconfident in his defensive position or distracted by another threat. Whatever the reason, he is not alert to the real danger until it is too late and as a result, he will fail at his duty and lose his life or at the very least, get tied up and humiliated. Now, throughout our series in First Peter, we have been encouraged to live holy lives, to continue to do good and to submit to various secular authorities. We've been encouraged to suffer well, knowing that our salvation is secure in Christ and that we are waiting here as aliens and as strangers for the coming of Jesus the King. And as we wait and suffer in various ways, Peter knows that we are in danger of becoming complacent about our real danger, of losing sight of our true enemy. It would be easy to think as we suffer ridicule, persecution or physical danger from the hands of certain people that they are our enemy, that the boss or perhaps husband who mistreats you or the bully in your life is the one who needs to be overcome. But no person is your true enemy. You may have someone who acts like your enemy, who treats you as an enemy, but as a Christian, human enemies are really no more than a distraction. Now, what does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 6? Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. People are not our enemies. They may be the face of our suffering, but in the end the most they can do is take our lives just our lives, he says. And what does Jesus say in Matthew of those who can take our lives? 
Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We are so much more than just a body. Peter has reminded us again and again that after suffering, we have eternity in glory. Suffering now, but glory forever. Around the world, Christians are suffering to the point of death. You know, Rappi went on his epic bike ride to Sydney recently to raise money and awareness for our suffering brethren. You know, he's planning an even more epic ride next year. It is right for us to be concerned about the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Christ, to remember that many are being persecuted up to the point of death And so we raise money and we pray and we weep and we rejoice. We rejoice because when they suffer, they are being counted worthy and their faith is being proved as genuine. And when they die, their suffering ends and they go to be with God in glory. Suffering now, but glory forever. The devil, our true enemy, wants us to give up to stop trusting the Lord before we die. Because after this life ends, we are beyond his influence. Because when this life ends, we are truly home. Now I asked my kids which animals they would least like to meet in the wild. Georgiana, my three-year-old, she answered that she doesn't want to run into a lion or a tiger in the wild. Um... Andrew, after Lion and Tiger were taken, Andrew said, well, I wouldn't like to run into a snake. The devil is first introduced to us in Genesis, in the garden, as a snake or serpent. And again, in Revelation, he is that ancient serpent called the devil. The idea is of a crafty, sneaky creature trying to deceive us and lure us into sin. Here, however, in agreeing with Paul that our enemy is the devil, Peter does not call him a snake, but refers to him instead as that other fearsome creature, as a lion, roaring and hungry. Look at verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. What is it about us that the devil wants to devour? Well, we have already established that it is not our lives that he wants. No, the devil is a faith eater. He wants your faith. He wants you to look at the suffering in the world and say, there is no God. He wants you to feel persecution and say, this is too hard and give up. He wants you to be overcome with pride and stop relying on the grace of God alone, through faith alone. So, Peter tells us that how we wait for Jesus to return matters. We are to be alert to the devil so that we can resist him. Don't be that unwary guard in the action movie. Don't be distracted and lose sight of the true enemy. Resist him, Peter urges us in verse 9, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. If we look down at verse 12, we see that Peter sums up and explains the purpose of his letter to remind and encourage us to stand fast, to stand firm, in the grace of God, the salvation of our souls through faith that he spoke about back in chapter 1. So we stand firm and resist the devil by standing fast in the true grace of God. Now, the grace of God is a gift, an undeserved gift. It is a gift that we can only receive if we come to God with humility, recognising that we are completely helpless to save ourselves, to free ourselves from bondage to sin. 
So it is not surprising that Peter calls us to be humble, to cover ourselves with humility daily as we do with clothing. Look at the second half of verse 5. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. What a statement of both fear and joy. What joy to receive the grace of God, but what a terrible thing to be opposed by the living God, to have the Almighty against you. I suppose I haven't really thought about it from that angle before. I think we'd like to think about the nice fluffy stuff and focus on that. We focus on the humble thief on the cross who received mercy rather than the, th- the fate of the proud thief on the other side of Jesus who mocked him. We think about the humble tax collector who went home justified in Jesus' parable rather than the fate of the proud Pharisee who spouted boastful nonsense before God. We forget that God opposes the proud. Who did Jesus say we should fear? The one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell is the one to fear. You know, he wasn't talking about the devil. God Almighty, who opposes the proud, is the one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell. And that is exactly what the devil wants for us. So Peter says in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Friends, we all live under the mighty hand of God. Now that can be either a worrying thought or a comforting thought. When I was a boy, uh, my father's hand was at times a source of great comfort and at others a source of great and healthy fear. Now I can think of many times that knowing that my father was there to hold me, lead me, protect me with his hands was so comforting. But when I had disobeyed and I knew his hand would be against me, Uh, against my backside to be precise. Oh boy, was I scared. The fear of my father's hand kept me from doing many stupid things, I can tell you. Interestingly, as I got older and less fearful of that hand, that was when I started to do those stupid things and to walk away. If we can be comforted by our earthly father's hands, how much more so by our heavenly father's? And likewise, if we can fear the hand, the discipline of our earthly father, how much more should we fear the mighty hand of God if we stand under it full of pride? As you look up and imagine the mighty hand of God above you, will you stand proud and be opposed and have that hand against you? Or will you fall on your face in humility, helpless, and have the mighty hand of God lift you up in due time? In this chapter, Peter encourages three groups to live humbly as they wait for Jesus to return. The first group he speaks to, in verses 1 to 4, is the elders. He calls them to be shepherds, but to remember that the flock is not their own, It is God's. Peter here seems to be passing on that baton at the end of his life, that duty that Jesus gave to him in the last chapter of John's Gospel when Jesus restored him and commanded him to feed and look after his sheep. We are Jesus' sheep. If a snake and a lion is the best animal to describe the devil, A sheep is the best animal to describe us. Not particularly glorious, is it? Like sheep, we are prone to wander. wander. We need our leaders, our elders, to shepherd us, remembering that we belong to another. 
Have you ever borrowed someone else's car? Do you treat it and drive it better than your own? Not accelerating quite so fast, not taking those corners quite so hard. Elders need to treat the flock, the church, like it belongs to God and they need our prayers too to help them keep their priorities right. Well, the next thing Peter tells the elders is that they are to serve willingly as examples to the flock. Look at the three pairs of instructions in verses 2 and 3. The first pair, he says, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Ministry jobs are jobs of service, and service doesn't sound real glamorous. If that's your thinking, that's just pride. If we come to God with humility, then we'll be much more willing to serve each other. Last week, Tim challenged us and encouraged us to think about how we can all personally serve our church. I want to add my voice of encouragement. We need Sunday school teachers. We need people to help out with youth group. We need readers and prayers. God has given you all gifts to serve a church. Let's not be too proud to use them. In the second pair, Peter tells leaders not to lead for financial benefit, but rather to think of themselves as servants. Sadly, we often see on television or hear about those who try and get rich by selling blessings from God. Have faith, they say. Give me your money and you will get well. One of the great evangelical teachers of the last century was a man called John Stott. Chapo was another. John Stott wrote a stack of great books. You know, he could have made an absolute fortune selling his books. But instead he gave all the profit from book sales to support the ministry of the word. His thought was of service, not of financial gain. And finally, the third pair of instructions to elders, Peter says, not to lord it over the flock, not to seek power, but rather to be examples. Be examples of how to suffer and submit in a godly way. Now, did you notice in verse 1 that Peter addresses the elders by encouraging them to do these things? He lowers himself to being a fellow elder. He started his letter by calling himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. As an apostle, he could have commanded them to do these things, but instead he humbles himself and gives them an example of how to lead. And why should leaders humble themselves and willingly serve as examples? Because when Jesus returns, he will reward his good and faithful servants. Look at verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade. Never fade. Service now, but glory forever. Suffering now, glory forever. The second group that Peter addresses is the young men, those in the prime of their life looking to lock horns and challenge authority. Uh, I'm 32. Some of you refer to me as young. I was called young man in this church just last month. Um, I don't feel so young anymore, though. I have purposely didn't shave last night. Um, So when you're having a cup of tea and chatting to me later, you'll be able to see I do have a few greys in there. Okay, Not so young anymore. Um, (laughs) You know, I'm not so young. I've got this gut. I just can't get rid of it. Knees that ache. I dive around in games at youth group, but I don't bounce up like I used to. Getting old. I think about myself from 10 years ago. 22, university, I knew everything. (laughs) Talk to me 10 years ago, and I could have told you what your problem was. 
I personally didn't have any problems, <laughs> except for a great dirty log sticking out of my eye <laughs> as I tried to get the specks out of others. Gosh, I was proud. I do worry, though, about what I'll be saying about 32-year-old me in 10 years' time. You know, young men don't want to submit. Young men don't want to be humble. But that is exactly what young men need and what Peter tells young men to do. Look at verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. I mean, gosh, if I feel like I'm a stack wiser after 10 years of ageing, imagine what young men could learn from someone like Paul. You know, he's had a lot more time to get wise than I had. I was going to dob in Tim there, but he's away, and I thought that would be unkind. Young men, we, you... Not sure what camp I'm in. We need to sit at the feet of some of the older gents in this church and learn from the wise. Older gents, we need you. Teach us. Ladies, Paul, the apostle, uh, encourages you to all, all to similar behaviour as well. Now, the last group that Peter calls to be humble is uh, more inclusive. Um, the last group is everyone. Now, throughout the letter, he has talked about suffering and trials, and so there would have been many readers feeling rather anxious, I can imagine. You know, we read the news today, we listen, we get a bit anxious as, you know, the results of the postal survey recently, oh, we get anxious. We look at what's happening in the Middle East, we get anxious. We hear about the suffering of our brothers and sisters, we get anxious. We can become anxious about trials or suffering or just what is going to happen tomorrow. Peter calls everyone to humble themselves and give over the worries, their anxieties to God. Now, when we think of proud people, uh, we don't often think of the anxious, do we? We get this picture of a self-assured person, back straight and confident. But someone who is anxious can be proud too. They can be too proud to ask for help, too proud to rely on another. Now, if we are anxious about tomorrow, perhaps it is because we are too proud to trust God to look after us. Cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you, says Peter. Uh, John Piper says, who do you think you are not to trust the Lord and give him your anxieties? Who do you think you are? Don't be too proud to ask God for help. His mighty hand is above you, waiting to lift you up. Humble yourself under it, and in due time, he will lift you up. Peter calls us all to humble ourselves to be on our guard and to stand firm against the devil in the grace of God that comes through faith. Christian life means suffering now but glory forever. Look at the great promise in verse 10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast. As we stand in the grace of God, God himself gives us the strength to stand. What else can we say except to join with Peter in verse 11 with gratitude and humility and say to God be the power forever and ever. Amen.